it's a little handout that says PG&E 2010 yeah. through 2012. Um, do you guys have any questions on this? Because what I wanted to do was make it clear in a very, very simple, concise list of the kind of less testing, um, when it happened, where it happened, the sites, the decibel levels, and uh, the equipment that was used. So I didn't know if you were privy to that, whether or not. Now, I do understand, you know, I would, I would like to preface what I'm doing here. I do understand that this is about the geological surveys, that this is exclusively what you're taking a look at. But also, you need to consider that um, the permits that were handed out by California State Lands, um, right now they're under investigation the way they gave them out and the, the permitting process. You can see, hopefully you can see by the, the handout how high the decibel levels were. So even though you are considering the geological ramifications, you cannot separate the ramifications of the kind of testing, the technology, and the biological impacts. That is the reason why I gave you this. So you are aware of the decibel levels and that they are considerably higher than any of the threshold levels that should be looked at for marine mammals and endangered species. That, that needs to be clear. What I also provided to you, do you have the, uh, the, the copy of the resolution in front of you? Okay, so you have time to take a look at that, but that is basically asking for a suspension of all acoustic seismic testing. You do need to be aware that this is going on that there are investigations that are happening because of some potential violations with the past testing, and that the California State Lands Commission is looking at revamping their permitting process because of the biological <coughs> impacts, which you guys have noticed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments to hear in the audience? Yeah, this is J.A. Savage, California Current. I have a couple of questions. And first, it might, my dust, dust has been lost in translation. You said that there was going to be this information posted on a website. Can you give us a URL? This is uh, Student Shaco from pg and &E, and we have not set up the URL yet for this website. We're in the process of developing that. And when do you think it's going to be up? Uh, this is Richard Klemzak from pg and &E. We're working with our IT department right now to work out the bugs to get the website up. We expect it within a month as soon as we okay, get to so the Okay, so within a month, you mean April? Um, we hope to have it up by March. We've been working with the IT department. We're working through the bugs right now. Okay, so March is just a, a week away. This is why I asked. Okay. Um, and the second thing that you guys talked about but weren't really clear on, and that is whether or not you are going to pursue the seismic, uh, the sonic blast um, for the seismic investigation that was denied by the Coastal Commission. It sounded like you were, but it I, I kind of got lost there. Chris, do you want to summarize? Uh, I'll, I'll say what I said earlier, which is that we heard pretty clearly from the Coastal Commission that they don't want to hear back about high energy seismic surveys unless it's the last thing in the toolkit and we know exactly what seismic hazard data will come from it and that it is critical for the safety and valuation of the plant. So because there's all these other types of studies that can be done to um, constrain seismic hazard at the plant. We think that's, uh, we're not going to be able to answer that question for at least a year, maybe more. And it's likely that um, well, we, won't, we won't be discussing high energy seismic surveys again, probably for that amount of time. Um, and if we find out that it is, the information you could get from those is critical, then we may come back and um, have uh, PG&E and their, and their consultants look into 
how to evaluate the impacts and whether this can be done safely. And of course, the, the whole permitting process is not us, it's state lands and Coastal Commission. We have not said we'd never consider it, but we think there's no point in considering it for at least a year. Okay, and who's speaking? I'm sorry. I'm Chris of the California Geologic Survey, uh, speaking for the IPRP. Okay, um, great. So, Eric, when he opened up the meeting, he seemed to say that uh, CPC really wanted it done, though. So, um, I'm, I'm going to. This is, this is Edward Randolph with the um, uh, Energy Division Director for the PUC. Um, we will be uh, first and foremost think, uh, seeking the advice and counsel of the. Uh, the peer review panel um, before we go forward. Um, no decision has been made one way or another from what the uh, the, the, uh, the PUC would be asking PG&E to be doing going forward. At first, we're going to seek the advice of the panel. Thank you. Uh, this is Richard Sadowski from the Coast Alliance. I got a question for one of the presenters. Um, Regarding the slip rates uh, estimates on your presentation, you talked about using the use of LIDAR data. Um, can't that be replaced instead of using the uh, high energy uh, 3D seismic data and projecting the slip rates um, of the Husky Fault? So I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. The, um, LIDAR, of course, is, is, is extremely valuable data on land, so it's great for reevaluating the San Simeon terraces and the offsets along the San Simeon part of the fault. It doesn't do you any good offshore, and so you have to have um, either submarine bathymetry, uh, but uh, ideally you want, so you want um, marine so um, shallow seismic data to, to um, Give you the geometry of these channels that that uh, Stu mentioned might it might be there offshore, so lidar is great, but it's not um, near the plant because it only works on land. Um, but when you you said the San Simeon fault is connected to the Hosgrave fault, and then using some of those using lidar data on some of the inland faults, you can get that data, and then since there are a lot of uncertainties anyway, you can extrapolate it. Isn't isn't that a way where you could avoid doing the high, high energy seismic testing in, the, in marine protected areas? So, on bottom line, we're not talking about high energy seismic. That's, that's imaging the deep parts of the faults that we're, that we're not currently talking about. The low energy seismic surveys have largely been completed. We'd like to see the analysis of those. Um, those are for imaging the upper few meters of, of the sediments below the seafloor. Those are what will help constrain the slip rate. Hello, Marla Dobutan, uh, citizen of North Morro Bay and chair of Coast Alliance. Um, I, I too am, uh, have been interested in um, the use of using the LIDAR technology and um, seeing if you can combine, combine that technology with whatever else you have already done. And I noticed in the presentation from Mr. Sykes, yes, that he used uh, a LIDAR map and um, one of your maps or one of PG&E's maps, but he used them as a comparison. And I, I, I appreciate you doing that. And I think it's a direction that perhaps is, is um, appropriate as far for, for what we're doing in our area. Of course, we're, um, I know you're seismic people, and we're marine environment and human health people. So there's our concerns. Um, I'm interested, I'd like to know what um, CHIRP is. Somebody, you were talking about CHIRP, what, what is that? Please. It's, it's a low energy, uh, high resolution seismic method that um, images the sediments down to approximately 50 meters 
And the reason it's called chirp is when it's when you listen to the sound it makes on land, mm -hmm. like when you turn on the machine, yeah. it sounds like a chirping bird. About the same, about that's what it sounds like. It sounds like it's chirping. Oh, uh, do you know what the decibel um, level is on that? No, I know the frequency range is. You know, what is it? The mm -hmm. frequency range is uh, I think 500 hertz to 15 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a chirping bird, and it's about that that uh, volume. And underwater, you know, it's 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 somewhat different. But at on when it's sitting on the deck, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> okay, that's it, it is different in the water, quite a bit different. Um, uh, what else is I appreciate being able to come here and take a look and see what you're doing. I'd appreciate it if Eugenie would get that data information up for the public as soon as practical, and I'm glad to hear that you're working on that. We look forward to seeing all of it, the data and the maps, please. Um, we, can, we can tell a lot from, from the images, the actual images that you give. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for coming to the IPRP this morning. Um, we will take about a one-hour lunch break, and at 1 o'clock, we have a meeting here with the Independent Peer Review Group uh, with uh, Southern California Edison to discuss uh, seismic study projects at Songs. And because it is a public meeting, you are also welcome to attend if you're interested in seismic projects in the vicinity of the San Onofre nuclear uh, power plant. And this afternoon's meeting will be approximately from 1 to 3. And, and uh, there is a public, um, publicly accessible cafeteria.